Hello, everybody. Welcome to United Lodge of Theosophists San Diego here at the Aquarian Series. So glad to have you. Tonight, the name of our presentation is The Clock, and this will be given to us by Kirk Gradeen. Thanks, everyone, uh, for joining in and for your patience. Um, in putting together this presentation, I <laughs> discovered that the clock is really one of the most profound themes that a student of theosophy could undertake. And, um, and there's many reasons why that is the case. And after spending considerable time focusing on it, I've, I really feel like I've barely scratched the surface. Uh, and one of the reasons is that even at a beginning level, it is one where our terrestrial life is linked to what we might call celestial music. All earthly clocks have their origin in the great sidereal clock, the rotation of our planet and the yearly rotation of the earth around the sun against the background of the fixed stars. In the theosophical conception, the visible earth is a pivotal link in a sevenfold interpenetrating chain whose cyclic evolution mirrors that of the entire cosmos. The same is mirrored in the year, the day, and the hourly cycle of the clock. Each hour as each minute and each breath we take mirrors the mysteries of logoic unfoldment from a spiritual unitary root into mon monadic involution and reascent through self-conscious evolution back to the one. In that sense, the seconds of our earthly clock have their archetype in what we might call the beating of the great karmic heart, the perpetual systolic and diastolic motion of invisible nature expressed through the vortical motion of everything visible. And our lead quote for the week is a fabulous one to introduce us to the topic. Man is a sevenfold potential God who must progress around the 12 signs of the celestial clock until he has mastered the forces of each one of them in his own nature. The division of the solar year into 12 months as of the hours of the day into corresponding units and phases points to the archetypal language and archaic sciences of mystic number, geometry, and astronomy. This timeless wisdom was preserved and handed down, we are told, by divine beings to the earliest races of humanity. While modern astronomy traces the earliest known 12-fold division of the zodiacal clock to the 5th century BCE Babylonia, H.P. Blavatsky states that the divine knowledge associated with the zodiac predates the dawning of the human mind, that it was passed to the forefathers of the Aryan Brahmins, she wrote, by the spiritual ancestors of our modern adepts and Mahatmas more than 18 million years ago. Through these sons of God, born of Kriya Shakti, infant humanity got its first notions of all the arts and sciences, as well as of spiritual knowledge. And it is they who laid the first foundation stone of our most ancient civilizations. And it is from this same evergreen banyan tree of bodhisattvas that all divine incarnations, sages, and teachers of humanity in subsequent ages have emerged have always worked in perfect harmony with, is, with what HPB calls the great sorrows, the hidden music of the spheres, precisely marked out by the celestial rotations of the zodiacal clock. The serpents of wisdom, she wrote, have preserved their records well, 
and the history of human evolution is traced in heaven as is it, it is traced on underground walls. Humanity and the stars are bound together indissolubly because of the intelligences that rule the latter. Is all time relative, or is there a universal standard by which all relative experiences of time can be correlated? In Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, time is woven together with the three dimensions of space, forming a curving four-dimensional space-time continuum, what is called a block universe, encompassing the entire past, present, and future. Because of this continuum, spacecraft clocks run at different rates relative to their celestial coordinates. Einstein's equations portray everything in the block universe as decided from the beginning, the initial conditions of the cosmos determining what comes later. Surprises do not occur, nor does free will. They only seem to. For us believing physicists, he wrote in 1955, just weeks before his death, the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. In quantum physics, however, this view of time and causation is being radically reconsidered. The uncertainty principle states that no matter how a quantum particle is prepared or how carefully experiments upon it are arranged, that it is impossible to have a precise prediction for a measurement of its position, and also at the same time for a measurement of its momentum. The universe is probabilistic, not deterministic. Quantum entanglement means that when measurement of subatomic particles are made, this changes the characteristics of the entangled system as a whole, even when particles are separated by billions of miles in space. And this is very suggestive of theosophical teaching regarding that of universal unity and causation. Because human beings do have free will, the wise or ill-considered, the selfish or altruistic action of one person reacts upon every atom. Outcomes can be altered. The sense of isolation and separation is illusory. We are every moment participant in and affecting a universal field. Our ideas, in short, on duration and time are all derived from our sensations according to the laws of association. This is HPB from the SD, as you can see. Inextricably bound up with the relativity of human knowledge, they nevertheless can have no existence except in the experience of the individual ego and perish when its evolutionary march dispels the maya of phenomenal existence. What is time, for instance, but the panoramic succession of our states of consciousness? In daily life, the experience of time is relative to our state of mind. Whether it is in the form of a digital clock we carry on our wrist or pocket phone or the traditional round clock face hanging on the, in the family home, from birth to death, we mark and guide our activities and the cyclic train of events by calendar and clock. We sometimes find it tyrannical and limiting as we race against the clock to finish a project which has a looming deadline. Minutes, hours, and days seem to pass too rapidly. For the artist, philosopher, scientist, or musician absorbed in the demands of the creative task at hand, hours can pass unnoticed. In dream states, an epoch can pass in a few moments. As Thoreau found, in mystic states of higher noetic awareness, 
both time and space are transcended. The oldest Egyptian or Hindu philosopher raised a corner of the veil from the statue of the divinity, and still the trembling robe remains raised, and I gaze upon as fresh a glory as he did. Since it was I in him that was then so bold, and it is he in me that now reviews the vision. No dust has settled on that robe. No time has elapsed since that divinity was revealed. That time which we really improve, or which is improvable, is neither past, present, nor future. And Theosophy affirms that with spiritual awakening and buddhic insight, the seer accesses capacities of vision and intuition unimaginable to finite consciousness. Vast epochs are embraced, synthesized, and condensed into the present moment, as in the view from a mountain peak. The whole of humanity may be glimpsed in a singular person. In such golden moments, the eternity of a pilgrim passes as a wink in the eye of self-existence. Even the boundless silences, we're told, of pralaya can be experienced not only retrospectively, but as the unspoken homogeneous field weaving together all moments in time, transcending the illusory nature of succession and separation. Paradoxically, it seems, it is through such forms of synthetic spiritual awakening that precision and ripeness of skill in action arises. While time and its passage is illusory, Theosophy also teaches that a precise understanding and knowledge of the phases and stages of its movement have always been an integral part of the teachings of the mystery schools of antiquity. To realize the absolute harmony of spirit in the world of matter and differentiation, to begin bridging heaven and earth, we need to see both the similitude in all things, as well as the divine signature of immortal Akashic essences in the transitory phenomena of cycles. And it is in this way that we learn to initiate and to bring to fruition at the right moment and in the right manner, that which can make a beneficial difference in the lives of others. From Lao Tzu, in meditation, go deep in the heart. In dealing with others, be gentle and kind. In work, be diligent. In action, watch the timing. The study and history of timekeeping instruments, known as horology, is fascinating. And there are many excellent uh, articles online that one can consult, um, which we're not going to go into a lot of detail on today. The sundial, the water clock, the hourglass, and various forms of astronomical clocks are among the examples. The first known geared clock was designed by Archimedes, the great mathematician, physicist, and engineer of the third century BC. The Antikythera device, an artifact of Hellenistic Greece, is a remarkably sophisticated predictor of eclipses and planetary motions. After over 120 something years of study since it was first discovered, uh, a serious study by leading scientists in various fields, including mathematicians, physicists, astronomers, uh, linguists, etc. Uh, it was only partially rebuilt to exact scale in 2008. While similar in some ways to Archimedes' clock, it far exceeds the mathematical and technical ingenuity previously associated with ancient Greece.
from Helen Valberg. It has been said that the clock with all its complex mechanisms is the mother of machines. It might be more truly said that borrowing from its natural prototype, the clock has been their midwife. Man invents machines which by the necessity inherent in their desired function, imitate the workings of greater nature. As the technology, precision, and accuracy of a mechanical means of measuring time grew more sophisticated, the variability of the solar day and the solar year and their relativity based on location became increasingly problematic. The Earth's rotation is not a constant speed, nor is the obliquity of the ecliptic. And this means that mechanical clocks on Earth running at a constant speed will develop inaccuracies over time. In addition, local noontime when measured by the sun's position in the sky, as we all know, varies with location on Earth. The length of the day varies with the season and with latitude. So prior to the introduction of standard time, each municipality throughout the clock using world set its own clocks or its official clock, if it had one, according to the local position of the sun. And this served adequately until the 1840s with the introduction of rail travel in Britain. Speedy travel over long distances required the continuous resetting of timepieces as the train passed or progressed uh, in its daily run through several towns. To solve the problem, starting in 1847, Britain established Greenwich Mean Time, the mean solar time located at the prime meridian in Greenwich, England. All clocks in Britain were set to this time, regardless of local solar noon. Using telescopes, GMT was calibrated to the mean solar time at the Royal Observatory. And then chronometers or uh, telegraphy was used to synchronize uh, clocks throughout Britain and eventually through other parts of the world. And it became a standard, uh, an international standard. Today, modern technology has made possible an extremely precise shared global system stretching across longitudinal zones. Dubbed Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC, it is determined by the weighted average of over 450 atomic clocks around the world. This has brought an unprecedented level of conformity and accuracy to timekeeping which is very necessary for space travel and other fields of our most advanced technology and science. Since 1960, the standard unit of one second has been defined as the time it takes for a calcium atom at ground state to oscillate 9,192,631,000 770 times. And this oscillation is known to be so stable that uh, it only varies by one second every hundred million years. And then leap seconds are added at regular intervals to coordinate atomic clocks with uh, actual Earth rotation as it varies across the year. And thus collated uh, this universal uh, a timekeeping system is communicated now worldwide via satellites. So we have almost instantaneous uh, updating of our, of our cell phones or electronic clocks. Examining the geometric and numeric aspects of the clock naturally leads us into other dimension, dimensions of symbolism, the importance of geometry and number in relation to theosophical teaching cannot be overstated. H.P. Blavatsky called geometry, quote, the alpha and omega of mystical conception, unquote, in its transcendental application to all seven 
of the divine sciences of the once universal wisdom religion. The most basic geometrical constructions, such as the circle, triangle, and square, are pristine symbols of deific, immortal presences. Like the sacred portraits given of the fully awakened sage or bodhisattva, whose heart beats in unison with the logoic sound and light of all humanity and of the cosmos, fundamental geometric forms represent living moral and spiritual paradigms, coexistent with the generative and unchanging, all-pervading foundations of life. So profound and integral are they to spiritual knowledge and self-transformation, wrote HBB, that the deeper levels of ideation they pertain to are only realized through initiation on the path of renunciation. Geometrically, there are three aspects immediately evident with the pre-digital clock phase, the circle, the 12-fold, and the 60-fold subdivision of its circumference. If we walk slowly through the geometrical basis of each of these aspects, we find them replete with correspondences found in the secret doctrine and other theosophical writings. To start with, all ancient cosmogonies, wrote HPB, begin with the circle as the fundamental form of the whole and of all living things. God is a circle with center everywhere and circumference nowhere. Ontologically prior to the drawn circle of bounded circumference, consciousness, we're told, is rooted in the timeless unbounded sphere of abstract space, the highest deity passed over in silence by the Pythagoreans. Both void and plenum, it is the non-dual reality called parabrahm or paravak in Hindu philosophy, the face of the deep in Genesis, chaos, the chaos of Hesiod and Homer. The boundless circle suggests omnipresent eternal duration where past, present, and future no longer apply. Kala is the pre-Vedic god of boundless time, connected with the Greek Kronos Saturn, who devours both being and non-being and all lesser divisions of periodicity. It is the one life, unconsciously experienced by every human being in dreamless sleep, and consciously sought by the yogi in profoundest reverie. While appearing as darkness to the unawakened, it is absolute light to the seer. From HPB, esoteric philosophy divides boundless duration into unconditionally eternal and universal time and a conditioned one, Kandakala. One is the abstraction or noumenon of infinite time, kala. The other, its phenomenon appearing periodically as the effect of mahat, the universal intelligence limited by manvantaric duration. The white circle of the clock face recalls the opening passages of the poem. It typifies the monad as primeval unity, first linked with the unmanifested logos. It is the pre-cosmic boundless plane or universal soul. Simultaneous, wrote HBB in, uh, this is from Transactions, simultaneous with the unmanifest uh, monad or logos is the diameter line of the circle, the divine parent called Father Mother, Purusha Prakriti, Prajna and Maha Karuna, fire and water, from which proceeds the second logos, the manifested. If the diameter line is vertical, the one and the zero is the number 10, pre cosmic ideation 
the heavenly man, the source of all consciousness, the origin and culmination of all human knowledge, and the androgyne synthesis of the creative builders. And as she says here in this remarkable quote, the one number issued from no number, it is from this number 10 that the whole universe proceeded. But if the line is horizontal, and in some cases she suggests it is, <laughs> or perhaps it's both, uh, then it is the symbol of divine substance, homogeneous matter, the material basis of every plane and every form of embodiment. In other words, spirit and matter, the vertical and the horizontal are identical in their essence. In perpetual motion, the two lines become the svastika, the sacred sacrificial spirit of both descent and ascent in endless periodicity, the ceaseless flow represented by clock time. Geometrically, both horizontal and vertical are needed in order to delineate an upright equilateral triangle within a given circle. In harmony with the Dharma of consciousness and divine eros, the periodic one becomes two and three. The first and fundamental principle of occultism, she wrote, is universal unity or homogeneity under three aspects, the metaphysical triad from which proceeds all manifestation. This triune logos of spirit matter fohat is the radiant essence garnered from an infinite number of previous cycles of evolution. In the metaphysics of the stanzas, it arises before periodic time, during the seventh eternity of the Maha Pralaya. Within it, everything that will arise in the sevenfold Manvantara is held in potentia. And in stanza three, we're presented with this remarkable idea that there is a strict numeric symmetry between the seven great periods of the Manvantaric wheel and those of Pralaya. And in transactions, HPB states that, quote, universal or absolute mind always is, whether there is a universe or not. Even in Pralaya, that mind, though latent, is one with immutable law, apparently also suffused with the mystic character of number, thus sanctifying, she says, the division of the indivisible. The third logos is associated with both Mahat, the manifesting cosmic mind, and Manas, the higher mind of all humanity. From it, the seven Dhyanis are emanated. By mystic transmutation, wrote HPB, the three in one becomes a quaternary. The triangle becomes the tetractus, as the radiant essence becomes seven inside, seven outside. Geometrically, the fourth point may be taken as the monadic center point, already established in the center of the two-dimensional triangle. Simultaneous with the diameter line, it provides a rotational lia center in which the upward pointing triangle is mirrored in the downward pointing. Above is mirrored below. The interlaced triangle and the center point refer to the seven dhyanis, the manifesting agents of cosmic and karmic law connected with the seven sacred planets of our solar system, the seven kingdoms of nature, and the sevenfold principles of human nature. With the grid provided by the interlaced triangles and their common center, we can precisely locate the 10 points of the Pythagorean Decad. Brought from Eastern sanctuaries by Pythagoras, HPB wrote that this famous triangle, along with the plane, cube, and circle, 
are more eloquent and scientific descriptions of the order of the evolution of the universe, spiritual and psychic, as well as physical, than volumes of descriptive cosmogonies and revealed genesis." Unquote. Further, if we merely extend diameter lines from center to each nodal point, we arrive at the 12-fold division of the perimeter circle, yielding the 12 great orders, symbol of the zodiac and the nadanas, along with many other, a long list of other 12s in the philosophy. Uh, the remaining subdivisions into 60 minutes is affected via the five-pointed star, uh, in four rotations of six degrees each. Most known zodiacal clocks from the Sumerians of the third millennium BCE, uh, the ancient Babylonians, Egyptians, and Greeks, as well as Ptolemy, used base 60 as a numeric system for subdivision of the 360 degree sidereal cycle. Base 60 is called, uh, quote, a superior highly composite number, uh, unquote, as it has 12 factors, three of which are prime numbers. 60 is likewise the, the lowest common multiple of one, two, three, four, five, and six. Besides the esoteric significance of all this, uh, the, 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 there's a tremendous practicality to it as well. It greatly, the, the base 60 greatly simplifies subdivision via natural numbers. And as we have seen spatially or geometrically into polygons, it means that one hour of 60 minutes or a 24 hour day of four, uh, 1440 minutes can be divided evenly into sections of 30, 20, 15, 12, 10, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1 minute. It means, for example, that two hours converts exactly to 30 degrees of rotation of the Earth's axis and one zodiacal sign, or 30 degrees change in longitude. Likewise, one degree of longitude equals four minutes of time. In three dimensions, the most evident correspondence would be with the fifth platonic solid, the dodecahedron, briefly mentioned in the dialogue Timaeus as symbolic of the whole cosmos. Just as each of the 12 divisions of an hour on a typical clock face is formed of five seconds, so is each face of the dodecahedron formed of a five-sided pentagram. It is well known that the five-pointed star or pentagram and its line segments create what has come to be called the golden proportion or golden mean, a ratio found in countless ways in the plant, animal, and human kingdoms, and which undergrids the Fibonacci series and the logarithmic spiral. And in this case, in where a cube is inscribed within the dodecahedron, the relationships between the edges of the cube and the lines of the, of the pentagram are also in the golden ratio. The secret doctrine reminds us that both ancient India and Egypt connected the five-pointed star with the crocodile or sea dragon called in Sanskrit Makara. The dragon or serpent or Naga was in these ancient cultures a symbol of sacred knowledge and immortality attributed to the highest adepts and divine incarnations. Makara is also an anagram of Kumara, wrote HPB, uh, the mind-born sons of Brahma. And these refer to our solar preceptors, perfected beings and knowers of Atma Vidya. Quote, Munis and Rishis from previous Manvantaras who lit up 
our fifth principle in the middle of the third root race, unquote. Also taking incarnation in human forms, they instructed early humanity, as we mentioned at the outset, in all the arts and sciences, and, quote, formed the nursery for the future human adepts on this earth and in the present cycle, unquote. Might there come a day when such associations so illuminate our conscious awareness that each time we consult a mechanical clock and read the, the sacred, the divine message, the numbers given to us there, uh, or we consult the stars or the position of the sun in the sky, that we are gratefully reminded of the divine guardians and spiritual instructors of the human race, the logoic unity of all humanity and of our common human purpose. Would a deeper appreciation of the mystic and sacred aspects of number and geometry in this way help us to understand the influences and potentials of each passing moment, of each incarnation? Is such an understanding necessary in order to become more a more logoic being ourselves, seeking to benefit the whole by breathing, breathing benevolently, radiating the higher spiritual influences of eternity and immortality in the ephemeral cycles of daily life? The clock is indeed such a logoic wheel. Uh, a term used 12 times in the mystic language in the first uh, seven stanzas of cosmogenesis. It is a term used for an entire monvantra, as well as any microcosmic cycle within the great wheel, as also any world, globe, or being within that system. And in her commentary, HPB states that in relation to our planetary cycle, the great wheel is the whole duration of our Maha Yuga, from beginning to end, composed of seven rounds. Uh, the small wheels, referring to the uh, individual rounds, also composed of seven eternities. Within each round, as we know, seven races unfold, each of which is also a wheel. And in that sense, the whole of the secret doctrine may be seen as a treatise on the nature of the cosmic clock, the wheel of law. And uh, we have this remarkable uh, kind of summarizing statement from HBB. The cycle of initiation was a reproduction in miniature of that great series of cosmic changes to which astronomers have given the name of tropical or sidereal, sidereal year. Just as at the close of the cycle of the sidereal year, the heavenly bodies return to the same relative positions as, as they occupied at its outset, so at the close of the cycle of initiation, the inner man has regained the pristine state of divine purity and knowledge from which he set out on his cycle of terrestrial incarnation. Well, we, there's more, but I think uh, we should stop there. I've been going on for almost uh, 45 minutes now. So um, I think we'll, um, we'll call it a talk and welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. You've got you've already got a hand up, two hands up. <laughs> yes, Nathan. Wow, thank you so much, Kurt. That really just a, a, a lot, of course, like you said, and just touching the surface, but you you made some references that were very interesting to me. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just reminded of the Maori um, story. They they trace their their lineage back to the stars. They, they will sing you the song. Mm -hmm. If you if you participate in a poeri ceremony with the, with the Maori people, mm -hmm. they know where they come from, you know, they'll, they'll go all the way back. And it's of course related to the the secret doctrine, the, the the symbols that you provided with the, the dividing lines and everything, it just perfectly mirrors the way that they 
they describe the the creation and, and coming and that ever in the during in, in pralaya that the you know whether it manifests or not the mind is there and uh just makes me think that we are that we are the time that we come from you know you know that the light some there's a relationship of course between light and and time as einstein pointed out but um the, before we had the atomic clock, we had the you know chronometer that would help us to determine based on the stars, the location of the stars, time that was not affected by you know so for for navigation purposes on on the ocean, mm -hmm. and uh, and then now we have this atomic clock that is so stable that it only has one one second every hundred million years or something like that. You said. Right. This is kind of a good thing because it, we can we can actually depend on something. You know, we can we can <laughs> we can uh, set our calendar. You know, we can you know even if everything is changing based on you know our measurement of the entangled particles, we still know where we stand. But now, so those are just some of the things that you brought up for me. But I, I have a question, and it's related to something buried in one of the earlier slides that you, that you had mentioned about, um, now I, I don't remember exactly what it said, but um, it, it referred to the timekeeping on the walls. Mm -hmm. and, and this relates to the great dragon and the serpent because in, in stanza seven, she, uh, HPB talks about the great, you know, like the first couple couple races, um, so far back as the third deluge of the third Lemurian race, the great dragon whose tail sweeps whole nations out of existence in the twinkling of an eye. And then she just she just explains the great dragon has respect for the serpents of wisdom, the serpents whose holes are now under the triangular stone, the pyramids at the four corners of the world. And she she just mentions that all that you know in in this world, which is like a big clock in a certain sense, it's it's like there's I don't even know how to answer this question, but you you brought it up. So I wanted to mention what about these walls? And how does the in how does how could perhaps the 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 inside of the earth be containing the secrets of the of the cosmos and time? Mm -hmm. There's your question. <laughs> yeah. This <laughs> I, I love how fearless you are, Nathan. <laughs> diving in or referencing the stanzas and so on uh yeah and these uh remarkable statements that of course we don't uh, often don't know we only get sort of glimpses and hints at what she's really uh suggesting but this one quote that i did share near the beginning uh i'll just reread it it says the serpents of wisdom have preserved their records well and the history of human evolution is traced in heaven as it is traced on underground walls. Humanity and the stars are bound together indissolubly because of the intelligences that rule the latter. Well, the way that I took that is uh, in relation to statements that she makes offhand at several places in the secret doctrine where she says that there, there are underground crypts which are protected from spoilating hands inaccessible to those who are not ready or not prepared or are not supposed to <laughs> uh, uh, be able to access. And they're protected also from all, all forms of uh, natural uh, deterioration, et cetera, by some special un unknown means. And there's more than one location in, in uh, different parts of the earth where there are these underground centers where um the the records of of all are kept and there is you know so whether that's when she says you know walls whether she's referring to like a physical stone wall in which you might see a whole series of inscriptions um you know and and as we're told uh, that the entire secret doctrine which is, is the, has the most stupendous cosmological system of any known system can be recorded in a few pages of geometrical signs and glyphs. But part of that is that the the reader of those glyphs has to have that, you know, penetrating intuitive uh, vision 
to be able to grasp um, what's the, the the intended meanings, right? And to know um, the the specific application that is being pointed to in relation to seven sciences, you know. So that's it. A lot depends upon the reader of such things. So you and I might come across it and say, "Oh, well, there's some nice, you know, uh, markings on the wall," <laughs> <laughs> and not really know that, you know, uh, what's really being pointed to. So, but. Um, and then there, I am also reminded of uh, Judge's uh, story about um, uh, this mystic experience he has where he he is in a, a kind of underground chamber um, in which there, there are displayed, it's not markings on the wall, but actual uh, faces of beings uh, of all kinds um, particularly those one imagines who are playing critical roles in relation to the evolution of humanity, but that so so that the walls she may be referring to may not be physical walls at, at all. That's that's my point. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that is certainly part of the um, of the the tradition which HBB points to is these secure underground locations. And, and access to them, which can only be found if one is intended by the masters to find them. Yeah, and I, I just love the, the, that it can all be in a, in a you know, in a, in a symbol. Talk about saving time. Talk about, you know, efficient. <laughs> uh, uh, right. right, yeah. But of course, it's, you know, it's, extremely complex and extremely precise you know there's if you uh if you consult the uh the preface in this in the voice of the silence for example she adds a whole another layer to this which she calls you know the the symbolism of the uh, logogrammical symbolism of the mystery language that there's um there's certain signs that are given at the beginning that indicate the manner in which the thing is to be read and then there's variations according to uh, uh, color and uh, um, and other uh, features, which would alter the the way a, a particular passage or a series of symbols is read. Um, so it really, and then she also says, you know, uh, that uh, it requires being able to um, access. Uh, I think she says it's seven levels of ideality, although she only names three of them. And she says the other four, I, I can't really explain to you. You wouldn't understand them if I tried to explain it to you. <laughs> you know, so it's yeah, really, so it's, it's really, really, I'm sorry, just the last point is that it requires the 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 traveling of the Bodhisattva path. That's that's what it that's the only way in which these deeper capacities uh of of uh knowledge and of intuitive insight of direct insight and seership are are properly co cultivated so and that would allow you know what time it is. would it would allow you to read you know what might look to us like a simple symbol you know to see the the, the deeper significance and application Amazing. so um thank you Judy had her hand up for a minute, but I just did want, I, it's not there up anymore, but I'm sure she'll come back. But just, you mentioned the uh, kind of the Bodhisattva, well, actually there, the Bodhisattva path. And there was that one quote from Lao Tzu that um, talked about gentleness, but it also talked about uh, timeliness, it seemed like. And I was just wondering if you could, um, kind of, and also the idea that in the voice of the silence, the compassion is identified as, as the law of laws. And it seems that this whole subject of the clock is like cyclic law, and as you said, the heartbeat. But I was, anyway, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about uh, the, uh, the Lao Tzu quote. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll read it. 
um, rather than trying to get up on the screen again. It says, in meditation, go deep in the heart. In dealing with others, be gentle and kind. In work, be diligent. In action, watch the timing. That that last line, it's it, it seems to me to be sort of like tongue in cheek, you know. The okay, watch the timing, you know. Uh, it, it's sort of like he he's just hinting at you know the 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 kind of precision that he himself uh, or that a sage a true sage would realize you know the exactitude to know when and what to say to the right person at the right time when action is needed when an incarnation of a specific type is needed uh, and all of that. So it's so it it it, it is uh, you know the this whole idea about uh, the the clock in relation to the you know the monadic stream, the whole cycle of monadic evolution, the series of races and rounds, um, and and the association of the zodiacal signs, all of them have reference to and i didn't i didn't get to this point um but it's a um the hpv does give us some very clear hints about how the the whole cycle of um seed and root manus that are associated with the the monvantaric cycle which we we think of it in terms of uh, factors of 14 and 7 14 manvantaras equaling a Maha Yuga. Um, and each uh, each associated again with the root and the seed manu, meaning what? Meaning that there's this descent of the logos into human form to, to initiate, guide, and instruct, uh, or to oversee, to aid all beings, and, and, and who's who's both watching over the whole process and aiding it at the precise time, doing exactly what is needed at the right moment uh, to, to maximize the opportunities for beings involved in that cycle to, to uh, realize the, the um, specific uh, capacities that are to be or can be awakened, the opportunities that are going to arise through the cycle um, um, that, that uh, where, where um, faculties can be awakened and and where the greatest good can be realized on behalf of the of all beings engaged in the cycle. So um, and the 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 other thing is that uh, so that's that's a, seems to me to be one of really the uh, the key uh, lessons about the study of the zodiacal cycle is this coordination with um, the. Uh, what we call the Monvantark cycle, and the and the, a deeper realization and appreciation for the involvement of divine beings in it, <laughs> um, and the the um, and the and the uh, responsibility that we have um, in 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 relation to them, and also with to the little that we may have been able to garner from the teaching, um, it, and its uh, and its dis dissemination through. Um, both theory and practice um, to you know as wide a field as we can manage. So that all of that to me, yeah, is like a part of what we might call the beating of the karmic heart. And and also just one last point on this uh, question, beautiful question, Jonathan. Um, that um, again, going back to the to geometry. I think this is one of the things that just in the last few years, I've started to really get a little bit more, <laughs> uh, just little glimpses of, is that there, there is a moral, the, the, one of the great values of meditation upon um, number and symbol and the way that we've, you know, it's just sort of started to talk about today, is that they're, they're pointing to moral dimensions of our nature that have to be realized. That is the capacity for the heart to universally embrace, be cognizant of, 
and to intelligently uh, assist and aid all, all spheres, all dimensions of life, um, uh, which are, which of which we are composed and of which our daily life is composed, you know, so it's this um, universality of the, the ethics that synthesizes with the universality of the metaphysics, you know, and that's part, it seems to me, that's part of the real value of meditation on these themes. Thank you, Kurt. Judy? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, Kurt. Um, I was wondering about the relationship of the precession of the equinoxes to family races, because I read someplace in the Sacred Doctrine that a family race, for example, the Jews, the Japanese, or various groups you could point to on the planet, will last about as long as that 25,000 plus year cycle, the precession of the equinoxes. Now, am I remembering that correctly? Because I, I, that's a very interesting idea. That that what is related to the precession? The, what what period of time? Um, a family race. Oh, a family race. Yes. Oh. Uh, in, in the yeah, I think I think you're. That's right. I think. Well, she she gives yeah. in one point. She gives I think thirty thousand years for a family race. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and that reminds me too of um, mm -hmm. one of the other things that she uh, generally. <laughs> points out <laughs> uh, because the tendency, you know, is to want to sort of nail down these time periods, right? But it, at, at more than one point, she says, look, there is such an overlap and sort of interblending and simultaneity of different cycles uh, laid one over the other that to, you know, to, 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 to nail things down, um, in in where you know you can uh you know do the equation and and you know uh achieve some real precision she says it's not gonna it's not gonna be possible there's there is a way to do it but it's you know, we're not being told because those those figures are are secret um and and damage could be done you know w with them if we uh humanity in its current condition uh knew too much but um at the same time, we see this uh, um, the, the patterns um, that are and ratios between cycles. So, so for example, um, like the Kali Yuga being one fourth of the next uh, a period, the next Yuga, and that being uh, uh, each successive Yuga being an additional fourth times the original Kali Yuga. And so on. It seems like something like that also applies in relation to race evolution. Um, so that, uh, which of course she doesn't, she doesn't give uh, an expl explanation of that. But if you try to make the numbers work, uh, you find that you have to. There has to be some sort of interpolation like that. Anyway, yes. Um, but the but what I would ask you, Judy, is how would you define a family race? Okay, how would I define a family race? Well, in, in this case, I was asking about the the physical nature of race. I know she hmm. uses race in the terms of ray, also the seven rays from the Dhyani Buddhas. Mm -hmm. And that's a different way to look at it. So um, yeah, I was thinking in terms of the uh, the more physical race. race. And uh, yeah. And in a way, uh, it's very difficult and superficial because, you know, white people come out of brown people and, and vice versa. And it's very complicated and right. perhaps not as important as the idea of the race. Yeah. Well, the um, one way, one helpful way to think about it, perhaps, is that each of these subdivisions of the races and, and sub races and family races they are uh, particular characteristics of vestures through which souls are passing. So, um, so that, you know, any external characteristics of virtue, whether it's virtue or vices 
or 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 physical characteristics or mental, psychic, etc., that those are those are ones being used by those souls passing through them. So they're not permanent properties uh, of that of that being of the soul being. Um, so that helps get away from that whole um, idea about you know superior and inferior. Mm -hmm. But I see uh, Ken. Did, Ken, do you have a question or comment? Yes, hello there, uh, Kirk, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. I especially appreciated you going from the Einsteinian determinism to the quantum mechanics where we have free will. Uh -huh. And I was wondering about that initial Helen Valborg quote about going through the 12 signs and we'll you know, master each of the energies and how it connected to the geometry of the three uh, forces in what you had a slide on that first fundamental principle that it's related to spirit, matter, and, and uh, fohat. And I'm wondering, does that mean that in the different 12 cycles that we'll probably, I'm presuming, will manifest through in different incarnations, <laughs> maybe several sets of incarnations to come up with all 12 uh, cycles that Helen Valborg talks about, 12 signs of the zodiac, that will mm -hmm. use different proportions of those three things in that incarnation, in that svadharma, of that set of lifetimes? Does that make sense, that we would have different ways of combining the spirit, matter, and fohat in a particular incarnation to master those forces that Helen Valborg's quote talks about? Well, that's that's a really interesting way to think about it, Ken. I, I've never really, uh, you know, tried to put it together that way. I think you would. Uh, it, it it's probably um, a, a good beginning way to to uh, to begin thinking about it. You know, we also get that threefold division between uh, uh, what's called monadic evolution. Uh, the intellectual having to do with the monastic evolution and then physical evolution. That's one of the uh, uh, three systems of of, uh, of evolution which HPV does distinguish, and which she says we have to we have to keep them. They each have their own laws, even though they are also interblended. Um, but that uh, um, the the complexity arises, like you're pointing out, not only in relation to what might be, uh, uh, let's say, and the uh, opportunities arising as uh, through engagement with particular, uh, uh, let's say, we'll call it zodiacal, but we're really, as you're pointing out, we're really talking about um, a very uh, sort of esoteric way of referring to um, specific um, conditions of 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 matter, of consciousness, and of energy, um, and also of human capacity. So, just as a very very broad um, uh, sort of beginning look at it, for example, the uh, the fourth round in which we are in is overall it's uh, associated with the fourth principle, right? And we know that 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 is that's sort of the overarching arching theme in which we're learning to manage um, and master um, uh, and overcome all lower forms of desire in order to realize the very highest forms of um, fohatic. Uh, capacity um, in which that there is that bridging uh, the, uh, or the capacity for bridging uh, the divine with the human, and uh, so yeah, I think I think that uh, just as a general sort of schematic is very helpful. But then I th you also need to bring in the planets <laughs> uh, and the sevenfold nature of uh, of human nature, right? Um, because uh, I. The uh, that threefold scheme of monadic evolution uh, is uh, particularly in the teachings uh, associated with Hermes is also has to be understood in in relation to the entire sevenfold uh, nature of of um, of the human constitution, um, and then as you're mentioning in relation to that that program. Uh, in its passage through the 12 great orders. 
So I, that's kind of just a very brief, uh, you know, and and cursory way of starting to think about it. But I, I think you're onto something there. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Kirk. And I do appreciate your wisdom. Thanks. Uh, okay. Maybe someone else would like to comment on that question. Does anybody um, have a question or a comment about any part of the talk or any part of theosophy that, for that matter? We are just about at the end of our time, but this is uh, a good good opportunity. Anybody here in the hall besides? Um, I think it might be appropriate, given that uh, in what we're experiencing in this time, if we talk just a little bit about the origins of the swastika, can we flush that out? Were you able to hear that, Kirk? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, we just mentioned a couple of points about it, and uh, that um, I think we could add a couple more, perhaps. One, uh, it, it is, it has been a misused symbol, of course, and. Um, since World War II, you know, it's become uh, so plagued, you could say, so stained and soiled by the um, the misuse of it that one hesitates to bring it up. Uh, but it is part of the Theosophical Seal. It's at the very crown of the Theosophical Seal. And it, it has a, a very deep cosmic and human significance to it. And um, the one that we mentioned was the this uh, uh, perpetual motion uh, associated with the um, with spirit and matter, with consciousness and form, one in their origin, yet in manifestation, um, uh, triple, uh, and. And in that, um, in in the cycle of manifestation, continually in motion. That is, spirit continually descending uh, to to um, uh, the deepest depths of matter uh, and of differentiation, um, the the utmost crystallization uh, of its own nature, in order to create a field in which the the maximum uh, degree of of evolution and of aid can be given to to uh, those uh, monadic uh, centers which have not yet awakened to uh, self conscious intelligence um, and or to divinity. Um, so that's the you could say that's the the inherent sacrificial divine <laughs> loving uh, descent of spirit, which is is associated, of course, with um, enlightened beings from previous cycles of evolution who are activating the whole thing. Um, and <clears throat> that at the same time, only being able to do so through the uh, progressive condensation of the homogeneous substance, which is described in various ways as like the churning of the ocean of milk, or the, um, the the condensation of steam into water, um, but it is also a a, um, uh, a crystallization of spirit itself. But it's those two contraries of spirit and matter in uh, uh, perpetual motion. It's a constant perpetual motion, but becomes a vertical motion and a manifest motion during periods of um, uh, of, of life and of, of the Mantra. So that's one one way of beginning to think about that that uh, the rotary motion suggested by the the arms of the swastika. The other that HV mentions is that, and it's related, of course. She makes very it sounds you know very uh, 
simplistic, but she says that one of the arms reaching up is is the um, the aspiration towards heaven, and the arm reaching down is the uh, benevolence towards earth. So it's really also a symbol of those beings who link the very highest uh, spiritual knowledge and wisdom with uh, manifestation in form and and aid to all beings. And it's it reminds us of the uh, you know the very beautiful moment in the Buddha's awakening where he touches the earth in order uh, to have a witness to the um, to his awakening. Um, so there's just a, a couple of ideas um, that I think are hopefully suggestive. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, Monica, for the question. I just, just incidentally, I've been to um, a place west of Chengdu, China, which is kind of in the northern plateau of the Himalayas. And there's those swastika symbols all over the place with the Tibetan prayer flags. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I asked the people that were there, what's up with those? And they said, oh, they've been here for thousands of years. So that kind of, that's just part of the culture. And he didn't really know much. He was a tourist guide, you know, and he just didn't want it. He didn't know much about it, but it's just, it's just part of here, you know. <laughs> okay. So it's interesting. Um, do you, you have time for a water? It's supposed to be a universal symbol for water. For water? Oh, the Swazi is supposed to be a universal symbol for water and like, you know, motion, you know, the water of life kind of thing. Yeah. Makes sense because if you look at it, it looks like spilling water. Well, she actually at one point, she, uh, HPB mentions that, um, like, the Pythagorean decad, she makes a similar statement. She says that for someone who understands that symbol, the whole um, uh, process of cosmic manifestation can can be uh, identified. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very it's a very deep and elaborate symbol. It's got tremendous depth to it, but we simply, you know, don't have the faculties. Um, one last question, Miluka. Uh, hi, um, interesting as always, <laughs> Kurt. Thank you. Um, we are seventy percent of water, and the planet is mostly water. As people call it, the Earth, the blue, the blue planet. Now, saying that, um, we are affected by all the movement of the planets, as you know, the moon influences. So we are actually a clock too, because in Chinese medicine, they do exercises according to the time of the day. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to do it in a clockwise. It's supposed to be affecting each of the organs, the main organs. Mm -hmm. Then there are religions also that uh, pray, do prayers four times a day to each Cardinal point. We yeah. know the Native American uh, are they follow that too when they do their prayers, and that the cardinal point reflects a have a different color and it's a different time of our cycle. This the spring, like childhood, uh, uh, the east, and then the west. You know the red road, which is the adolescent. Then the west is adulthood. And then the north decay, you know, the the ancestral road. So I'm thinking that if we take this in consideration, we are a clock. And we are affected by everything and we can affect other things too. And Chinese medicine also say that we should be in bed uh, by or before 10 because that's when the body starts uh, cleaning itself out. And, and if you want to go even earlier, we don't follow the rhythm of, of nature because after the sun goes down, we're supposed to go to bed too. So we alter a lot of things and then we sometimes complain why we are not so healthy. Anyway, just to add up. Yeah, no, that's that's a great comment. If I may uh, respond just briefly, the um, one of our aspirations when we we first uh, started preparing for this talk was to to demonstrate how each two-hour segment of the day would correspond to one of the zodiacal signs. 
and also to a, uh, a certain period of race evolution. Um, and we have some, we started putting some diagrams together on that, but it just got too deep and complex. But, but it, but it, it would seem that a, um, well, that one who is awakened, that there would be this synthetic, uh, this is kind of one of the fundamental points we were trying to make, this synthetic understanding so that the 24 hour clock would be intimately understood in relation to the, the grandest cycles. And that would help define and understand what is what is happening at a particular moment in time. And, um, and but but all of that seems you know so much to try and take in when you think about the complexity of it all. But one of the the uh, key clues and and uh, practices that is given uh, by Raghavan Iyer, which I've not, never seen anywhere else, maybe others have, but you do find it reflected in other traditions, is that we can't that that there is a. Um, we can take advantage if we split the day into four quadrants <laughs> and we we use the two sandhyas, which are the prime time for meditation, for returning to a deep reflection upon our true nature, our unity with humanity uh, and, and uh, great beings and our responsibilities, et cetera, in the deepest possible uh, spiritual sense that we can uh, bring that to bear. Uh, we use the two sandhyas. And we pick a third point during the day at a midpoint near noon or about noon and use that also as a means to, to return to that inmost center um, that we will, in doing so, we create this a wheel in which the fourth point occurs in deep dreamless sleep. And wow. that, that will actually allow us to begin to uh, better assimilate what happens in, in deep sleep and to bring back, you know, that treasure treasure of the gods that occurs in those um, unconscious states, but are nonetheless very valuable. Yeah, and it also, of course, links up with the idea of the four maharajas, which HPB talks about. Each of the cardinal points is associated with one of the key, the four key dhyanis, right? So you think about you're linking up again the the daily process with the cosmic process and cosmic unfoldment. Thank you, Maluka, for that. I, I said the last question was the last question, but Betty. Hi. I, I, what you said just kind of triggered a thought, so I had to um, mention. In the beginning, someone mentioned Makora, the crocodile and the five uh, stars. So what you said made me think of um, in ancient Egypt, Sobek was the crocodile god who birthed the Nile, the waters of life, and even though this is a god, I guess it was an intersex god, um, referred to as a man, he still laid the egg, the cosmic egg, that created the world and the waters of life, but also like a god of the underworld and, and so forth. So just a really amazing kind of like um, god throughout time. And I just thought that was an interesting thing going through all the things we've said today. So I just wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Betty. Sure. Well, Kirk, um, you've done a splendid job. I still remember when I asked you to do this, I got quite the silence, but <laughs> you, you bravely and fearlessly did it and just a magnificent masterpiece. So thank you very much. Um, and the um, it's just in the way of thanks, um, the way you effortlessly interwove the microcosm with the macrocosm back and forth, that dialectic, and just made it so that we are all that much more alive as to, you know, the intricate, intimate timing of everything um, fitting in with the whole uh, majestic sweep of the human pilgrimage. So I thank you very, very much for that. Uh, next week, um, We'll be hearing a presentation on the Platonic Quest. And um, I always think of a quest as a series of questions. And everybody has their own questions. And uh, many uh, really good questions were brought up tonight. And as we kind of unfold questions through life, we find that we're all on a quest. 
And, um, and I think that's quite a bit of what the Platonic quest is about. And we will hear some, you know, uh, Alfred North Whitehead said that uh, all of Western philosophy is a footnote, is a footnote to Plato, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you very much, Kirk, and thank you all for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste. Thanks. Namaste. Have everybody. a good one. Thank you. Be safe, everybody. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.